Hello, welcome to Research Aromatica. Today's talk is natural products inspired antiparasitic agents with Dr. Victor Ogunbe. And here's Victor right next to me. I'm gonna read his, <laughs> hi Victor. Uh, it's so great to have you here today. I just wanna read your bio um, for the audience. Victor is a professor of chemistry and biochemistry at Jackson State University and the managing partner at Biomolecular Science, LLC. He received academic training in chemistry, biotechnology, and chemical biology at the University of Alabama and Scripps Research. His scientific interests are in medical chemistry, chemical biology, drug discovery, and molecular recognition. His current research focuses on using early stage drug discovery tools and machine learning to identify new biologically active all molecules and biologics for infectious disease, crop protection, pest management, and cancer therapeutics. He's a member of the American Chemical Society and the American Society of Pharmacognosy. Wow. <laughs> it's great <laughs> to have you here today, Victor. It's a wonderful bio, and I'm going to Go ahead and turn the floor over to you to start your slides. Well, thank you, Angie, and uh, um, thank you for that, uh, for the invitation, and certainly for the for the introduction. And I uh, want to thank um, APRC for the opportunity, and more so uh, for the great work that you guys are doing with this uh, uh, webinars. And I, I think uh, it's, it's a great concept, and uh, happy to be part of it. And uh, good morning. Uh, no, sadly, good morning to uh, to the uh, attendees. Um, pleasure to have you. And uh, this morning, I'm going to be talking very broadly, uh, more so about uh, uh, the role of natural products uh, as antiparasitic agents. Uh, certainly, because of the nature of this talk, I'm going to be as broad as possible, uh, while also highlighting some specific examples uh, of uh, how we apply or use some natural product scaffold in our research and uh, please feel free to uh, ask questions or stop me you know during the presentation if, if you like uh, that that would be fine although we do have a question and answer uh, uh, a q a uh, section at, after my, uh, my my talk so uh, very uh, briefly this morning uh, the outline of the presentation is going to uh, be focused on the four main uh, themes here I'm going to be talking now about what are antiparasitic agents, uh, what are the most common, you know, very common clinically important parasites, and certainly uh, how has, have we applied the concept or the, um, what we know about natural products uh, to be able to develop at least two uh, class of very essential medicine, more so of, um, with application to tropical medicine. And lastly, I'm going to touch on about three areas of the three projects in our lab where uh, we use natural products or have uh, applied natural products to uh, uh, as part of a discovery uh, discovery process and some of that would just be more of looking at the, the concept while uh, sadly uh, we have uh, some of those projects still uh, still um, in progress so uh, the first thing is uh, generally in you know, the water and parasitic agents just like um, name suggests that these are uh, drugs typically you know, which you use either to prevent or to treat uh, parasitic uh, diseases and uh, there is a lot of parasitic diseases uh, mostly uh, and those go you know be caused by both the endoparasites and the the ectoparasites uh, the perhaps um, more so the endoparasites are the most uh, significant um, it causes a lot of uh, infections and a lot of um, um, certainly uh, clinical uh, cases and those would be things like uh, protozoan diseases uh, caused by uh, plasmodium or, uh, or, or trypanosomes. And we do have uh, things like flatworms and roundworms, which also causes uh, significant uh, 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 infections, more so in the younger children in the tropics. And likewise, uh, some you know, ectoparasite, the ectoparasite are probably not as common, uh, but because we do have some quite effective uh, uh, medicines or agents to be able to, to, to take care of them. So things like ticks or lice or, and mites and, and fleas and, and so on. So, but uh, this morning I'm going to touch on a couple of the endoparasites uh, at least that causes um, significant uh, mortality and also morbidity 
uh, um, in some regions. So suddenly, you know, parasites are not as common as uh, as it used to be, but we still have you know, significant number of uh, parasitic infections where uh, a lot of um, uh, individuals um, uh, still get infected and suffer from it. As part of the, um, you know, the two perhaps most common um, endoparasitic infections are caused by um, protozoans, and the very important one is the malaria uh, uh, infection, malaria parasite. Uh, malaria is caused by plasmodium. Uh, we have you know, different um, species of, of plasmodium, but, but the most common one uh, that causes a significant mortality is actually a plasmodium uh, fasciprum. We have a plasmodium uh, uh, ovale, plasmodium vivax, which also causes uh, clinically recognized uh, uh, diseases um, in humans. And um, apart from plasmodium, uh, we also have trypanosomes. So trypanosomes, uh, they are two very common um, uh, uh, species, the trypanosoma bruzei and the trypanosoma, uh, uh, trypanosoma cruzei. Trypanosoma bruzei um, causes the, uh, so the African sleeping sickness or the human African trypanosomiasis. Uh, there are two uh, several subspecies, but the Rhodesians and the Gambian uh, subspecies uh, causes the, um, the, the sleeping sickness, while the, um, the Trypanosoma cruzi causes what we refer to as a Chagas disease, which is common in, uh, in, in, in South America. Uh, although uh, uh, Trypanosoma cruzi is a, a, could be a, a, a chronic and an acute um, disease, uh, the common feature, uh, the, com the commonality between all uh, the trypanosomes is the fact that there is uh, um, not a, uh, effective medicine uh, to treat uh, both diseases. Actually, for trypanosoma um, uh, bruzei causing uh, disease, uh, which is a sleeping sickness, the, the, certainly the number of infection has gone down dramatically in the past decade or, or so. But just like you know, uh, in a 50 year, 40, 50, 40 years ago, we now we know that those diseases, uh, you know, after a while, you have um, a significant reduction in infection. But then the number of uh, the number goes back up. We've got a number of nitro aromatic compounds that are uh, reasonably good to treat the acute phases, and also, but they come with a significant uh, side effect and. Uh, part of the work in my lab is actually uh, looking for some new agents that could be uh, used to treat uh, infection caused by trypanosomes. Apart from uh, the protozoans, uh, the uh, worms are also a significant uh, source of uh, endoparasitic uh, infections. For example, flatworms like uh, schistosomes uh, causes a, you know, a significant um, uh, uh, river blindness as well as uh, around worms. So, for example, uh, uh, things like um, uh, strongy or ascaris or, or ascaris also uh, can cause significant uh, uh, mobility uh, in um, especially in children and some of the, the commonality for these worms is you know, things like uh, lack of proper sanitation or just a uh, lack of access to to uh, medical care could see it could lead to where you have uh, people who do not have access to medical care having uh, you know a lot of uh, very high burden of infection, very high uh, you know, and, um, number of worms, amount of worms in their body, and then that could uh, cause a significant, uh, um, uh, uh, could lead to death actually. Now, uh, one thing that is common to a lot of parasitic diseases is that it's a good number of them, or most of them actually occur or found mostly in the global south. So we know that um, for the vast majority of um, of diseases that are occur in the global south, there's a common feature, and the, some of the common features is uh, number one is a lack of uh, medical care in some cases. So we could have a lack of medical care uh, or primary medical care, but mostly. And then apart from that, also the lack of sanitation uh, in some region could also be another uh, another uh, you know reason for the eye burden or eye burden of the parasitic diseases in, in the global south but beyond that also the climate uh, the, and uh, also allows for uh, some parasites to be able to reproduce easily and to be transmitted by using any of the vectors so for example in the case of Chagas disease it's transferred uh, transmitted uh, through the kissing, bu uh, the kissing bug which can live very comfortably uh, comfortably in the tropical climate that you have 
uh, in, in South America and so also the uh, sister fly which uh, serve as the vector for the African trypanosomes can easily breed and be able to transmit the parasite both from the animal reserve, um, reservoirs to humans and from humans to animal reservoirs as the case may be. And so those geographical factors in addition to also the living conditions allows for a good uh, uh, you know, number of these parasitic diseases to continue to impact uh, millions of people uh, in the tropics. Apart from the global south, we also know that the fires, so things like in India and also in, the, uh, in uh, Indonesia, those uh, regions also have a significant high burden of uh, parasitic infections. So things like uh, uh, you know, dengue, or infections like Leishmania, you know, more so in, in the Indian subcontinent, also uh, have uh, there's a high burden of Leishmania. They are caused by um, the uh, Leishmania species. You have you know a good number of Leishmania cases also in Brazil and also you know certainly in South America. And you know the common thread here is certainly a lot of these diseases lacks the we, we do not have a uh, very good um, uh, agents to be able to treat them. And when they are treated, sometimes uh, they're not treated completely. And in some cases, it's just because of the development of drug resistance. So because uh, uh, you know, certainly, you know, over time, um, uh, a lot of the parasites acquire resistance, uh, whether, you know, just through evolutionary pressure, and they, then they become less um, less effective, which brings to the question of, okay, how, what do we do? How do we address this? address that problem and for the vast majority of infectious diseases uh, one way to do that is to either you know, have a very good vaccine right have a vaccination program that can take care of the uh, what that can immunize uh, that, that can um, uh, we can use for immunization and so that individuals can have uh, can certainly be able to fight the infection when they're infected but for some and uh, and uh, very importantly for some of the parasitic uh, uh, diseases the path to vaccination is really, really tough. So for example, malaria, there's been a lot of investment in, uh, uh, in trying to develop new vaccines or to develop vaccines for malaria, and that has not really worked. Although we, there is a report a couple uh, a month ago that shows that perhaps in um, younger children in West Africa, the, the clinical trial you know, uh, seems to, to suggest that perhaps the vaccine for malaria might be you know, uh, coming soon, but we know things like tri in trypanosomes just because of the uh, the antigenic, you know, because it can easily you know present new proteins in the coat that you know, in the outer coat that helps them to evade the immune system. And we know a lot of worms also do not uh, produce, as, uh, for example, the round worms do not produce any immune response in some cases, and that uh, were. Uh, that would mean that you know vaccine is not a very effective way to, to to address them. So, a lot of combinations apart from vaccine. Then the other options is uh, to use a drug or to provide an environment where people are not infected. So vaccine. So in cases where vaccination where vaccines is not effective, then what we can rely on would be to have very effective drugs, safe drugs. Uh, as well as also, you know, to provide, you know, things like a uh, vector control. So if you have, uh, if you can control the vector using, for example, you know, the so uh, of in the case of malaria, the um, mosquito uh, vector control, uh, mosquito net, for example, could be you know, something that we can use to prevent, you know, the transmission of the disease. But beyond, the, but apart from from the vector control, you know, um, it, what if, you know, if an individual is sick, then we need to have a therapy to be able to take care of the uh, to take care of the of the infection. And as uh, all of us have lived through COVID for the past year, we see that vaccination has gone up. But also, there are some people that still have some breakthrough infection, which in some individuals could be it could be very fatal. And what we need long term will also be some type of medication that might be able to uh, to treat uh, such individuals. And and that is also certainly true for uh, a lot of the. Uh, Parasitic diseases. Now, the reason why I'm using, uh, uh, why I brought this up, is that a lot of the parasitic diseases are now classified as neglected tropical diseases. And the reason why they are you know, neglected is just because there's not that much to take. Uh, th there's not um, a lot of investment in the area, to, more so in terms of therapeutics. But also, there is, um, uh, uh, in terms, of, well, the ability of the uh, countries where you have a lot of this infection to 
be able to develop uh, medicines, you know, take it from the discovery stage to, to, to the development stage is also is a significant of a financial burden and uh, what are um, a lot of you know, uh, groups both in the you know in the west but probably in the northern hemisphere and also with true private you know uh, public partnership is doing uh, is to try to use the expertise and also the resources available um, in the uh, in the northern hemisphere to be able to develop um, certainly medicines uh, against some of these parasitic diseases and for example uh, comp ventures like the malaria medicine ventures for example or dnd high have been investing you know millions of dollars uh, so uh, to be able to develop new medicines um, uh, DN, uh, DI to be able to develop new medicines against uh, parasitic uh, diseases. And the concept is working and it's working perhaps not fast enough, but we, we have examples of um, certainly uh, medicines there. It's not necessarily new medicines, but these things are were reported maybe 50, 60 years ago. For example, Fexinidazole, which was recently approved uh, a couple of years ago as, an, as a, the first oral medicine for sleeping sickness. Uh, was done through the effort of uh, DNDI and uh, and um, um, Doctors Without Borders. So they, they were uh, two groups that contributed significantly to be able to develop uh, that medicine and it's been approved for treatment of um, African sickness in um, in Congo DR. So certainly we still have a lot of the diseases that needs to be tackled. So for example, uh, Lishmania. Lishmania, uh, Lishmania is a big uh, uh, we have you know, a couple of medicines out there, uh, for example, but they are becoming less effective. So Lishmania is, is really important, Chagas disease. We only have two drugs and both drugs are not very effective for the chronic stage. We don't have very effective thing, uh, you know, uh, the antivirus for dengue or, ching or chikungunya, for example. And then um, for some of the, the diseases caused by worms, so for example, um, um, things like, let's see, uh, schistose or onchocasiasis, those we have actually very effective medicine, but access to it is also limited in some, in, in some context. So certainly there is a lot of, you know, a lot of need in terms of um, you know, drug discovery and also the use of the resources that are available, in, especially in some of the countries to address uh, these um, these challenges. Now, that brings us to uh, the first thing that I would like to, I guess the second thing I would like to touch on, which is the type of um, drugs or, or agents that we actually use to treat parasitic infections. We know that um, a, a drug discovery as it is, you know, um, you know today uh, relies uh, a lot on structural based drug design where you have a target perhaps a protein, it could be a receptor, it could be an enzyme, it could be, you know, uh, whatever the, 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 the target is, where um, if you don't have uh, a pre-existing substrate or an inhibitor to design, your uh, to make a new uh, uh, inhibitor around, what you can do is you do IEEE screening, where you find a compound or, men, or several compounds that can uh, selectively target that receptor, and then you can develop a program which is designed around you know, uh, optimizing the activity of that initial compound and also trying to improve the drug-like properties, right? So that, that's you know, the, the gold standard in terms of you know, uh, drug discovery uh, today. But we know that apart from that though, a very effective way of also discovering molecules is by uh, is, is certainly uh, discovering new drugs or de developing new drugs is also using natural products as a source of um, as a source of uh, of discovery, and that has worked. And uh, historically, a lot of uh, diseases caused by you know either bacterial infections. So we have a lot of antibiotics that we use uh, to treat bacterial infections, which have their origin from um, from natural products. We have uh, uh, some um, antiparasitic agents. So antiparasitic agents that we use. As that have their origin as uh, from natural products, and uh, just very quickly, I'm going to be talking about two of them. So, and one of them is the is this drug here. Uh, this is um, ivermectin. Ivermectin is a broad spectrum antiparasitic agent, and it's broad broad spectrum because it's able to actually um, uh, to is effective against several of uh, several uh, worms. 
uh, and uh, is used clinically uh, to treat um, to, to treat uh, you know schistomyasis and um, and, and a number of other uh, worm causing uh, diseases. But apart from you know, apart from avamectin, also we have uh, you know uh, quinine based uh, drugs. For example, um, things like chloroquine have the origin from uh, from quinine. And and basically, this is just a, you know just an example of two two types of molecules. But we know that the frontline medicine to treat malaria today, atomicinin, also comes from in, uh, of the the, uh, the uh, inspiration comes from a natural product. So we have a significant number of um, antiparasitic agents actually have their origin or from natural products, and natural products remain a good source of um, you know. For, for drug discovery against infectious uh, infectious diseases. Certainly, typically not the astral natural products that was originally isolated or extracted. In most cases, we have to modify the structure to make it more drug-like or to improve the potency in some cases, in some cases, certainly to reduce the uh, to reduce its toxicity, but by and large, the complexity that is being that is built into a lot of natural products scaffold allows, in some cases, very specific action and typically in, in some uh, and typically quite uh, quite effective. So, um, yes, do we is natural products still relevant to drug discovery in twenty twenty one? Yes, the question, the answer is, uh, is uh, that. The answer is yes, and uh, uh, quite effectively, uh, we can we can um, you know through ongoing work in our lab and in several labs, uh, we know that natural products are quite uh, are quite important. Now, in the case of avamectin, so avamectin um, is um, used to treat uh, at least approved for a couple of conditions, but we know there are several other conditions where you know it can be used for. Uh, Let's see. Okay, I guess I have to. So that it can be useful. So one of them is the um, what you refer to as a river blindness, right? Uh, uh, one of the diseases, river blindness, which is called caused by Onchocerca um, volvulus. Uh, just the uh, onco is, is 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 fine, and this can you know subtly is a very very you know could, could lead to blindness if the uh, disease is not treated. Apart from that, it's also approved to treat um, to treat the disease caused by uh, strongy. And strongy, uh, typically, you know, you can find a strongy. So this is a, a round one. It's, a, it's just like um, a C elegans, um, but it's, this is a parasitic uh, uh, round one. And the um, uh, the drug itself, you know, was originally isolated from a streptomyte, uh, streptomyces um, avamitilis. This is the, the picture of of, of a of a plate containing the bacteria, and this uh, drug itself is a 16 member uh, lactone. So uh, a 16 member lactone. So this is the, uh, a micro a macrolide, which is also decorated with a disaccharide here, um, olandron. Now there are several uh, several um, of the avamectin that were or avamectin that were isolated originally isolated from uh, streptomyces, but just about a couple of them is actually used clinically. Which is uh, this is one of them. This is a avamectin um, A one, avamectin A one. Now, the discovery of this uh, you know, certainly took a, from discovery to from uh, you know bench to bedside took a, you know, a couple of decades for that to actually happen. But most of the work. Uh, it was done uh, through the collaboration between uh, uh, Satoshi Omura in, in Japan and also uh, certainly uh, uh, William C. Campbell at Mark. And the, 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 it, it was a significant undertaking to be able to take this medicine to produce a good, um, enough, a high enough quality and quantity and for the clinical trials to actually demonstrate that this medicine is uh, could be used to actually treat infection caused by these two these two ones. But beyond this, uh, the avamectin is also being you know, shown to have a very uh, good uh, biological activity against you know, anything from coronavirus to leishmania to malaria parasite and, 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 and a whole bunch of uh, different uh, indications. But certainly, but, but um, uh, those uh, secondary type of indications uh, have not been clinically proven to, to be effective, but certainly to treat uh, intestinal ones. Uh, uh, ivermectin is, is very is very effective. Now, ivermectin um, 
uh, biosynthetically is made uh, via a very very complex uh, com complex uh, pathway. Although it is you know this is quite common for most uh, uh, macro lines to be made uh, in this way, where they uh, they are made uh, using this um, this assembly line or uh, involving you know. Of, in this case, about 12 uh, uh, units of, of different types of uh, enzymes, although most of the macrolide synthesis is made using these four clusters of, of, of enzyme of synthase. So we have the um, IVS 1, 2, 3, and 4. And each of the four uh, synthase, uh, synthase have you know, different subunits. So these are you know, uh, subunits and also uh, domains which are capable of, uh, of uh, carrying out different uh, functionalization as well as catalyze uh, different reactions. Now, as you see, so to actually make the microlight itself, so we have you know, these uh, upwards of 12 modules, about three or four modules per each of the synthase to be able to make the full length, um, the, the full length uh, polyketide. And then the polyketide is now uh, with cyclized. So you have uh, the final step here involves a thioesterase that you know, hydrolyze this and then it cyclizes to form the aglycone uh, microlite itself. And the aglycone microlite typically to be able to actually go from here to actually uh, uh, form the avamectin B1A, uh, the couple of additional steps. For example, what happens here is that the if E, it was a cyclooxygenase, well, with, uh, it forms a furan ring. So we have additional you know, a furan ring here, and then this is reduced. Um, uh, then you have the uh, the carbonyl here is reduced to form this um, type of uh, uh, XR, you know, tetra tetrahydrobenzofuran ring, which eventually uh, you have a glycosylation using a series of uh, uh, certainly using the FB one, but eventually what you do is put the uh, oleandros on that uh, on that microlyte to form the microlyte. Um, that was later microlite. Now, this is a very, you know, the active form of it, but also the, uh, like I showed previously, there are different forms of the ivermectin, uh, certainly you know, the different um, uh, uh, analogs of it. So, and the main difference here is it, uh, the presence or absence of an uh, unsaturation at carbon 22 and carbon 23, as well as the uh, methylation at uh, uh, the side chain methylation here makes the, the the, the difference between uh, each of the different uh, each of the different analogs, but certainly the perhaps the most effective or the one that is used clinically, one of them is uh, avamectin uh, uh, B1 B1A. Now, why is this drug really really important, and uh, why is it quite useful and quite selective? Actually, the the selectivity comes down to the fact that the um, worms generally or invertebrates uh, they do have a type of uh, uh, gated chloride ch channels that we don't that is not present in mammalian. For example, this type of channels is not present in, in mammalian uh, cells. So in, in the worms, what happens is that in the presence of ivermectin, that actually affects the transmission of um, of neuronal signals in a normal functioning uh, uh, nerve. Uh, when you have no uh, transmission, what typically will happen is that. Generally, you know, you have these uh, glutamate gated uh, chloride channels that uh, you uh, on the cell membrane, right? It's present on the cell membrane, and then when the um, the glutamate binds to the rest of the channels, that allows you, you can see here the chloride uh, uh, can go in, so it, it opens it up, right? The glutamate opens it up, it can go go, go in, and then once the glutamate is gone, then the channel closes up. And it's not able to allow the chloride ions to, to, to go in. Now, these uh, it will happen in the normal functioning nerve, right? Normal functioning nerve. And uh, you have, you know, just the concentration of chloride here is modulated by the uh, binding of, um, of, the, of the channel by, the glu by glutamate. And that allows for normal transmission of, um, of nerve impulse. However, in the presence of ivermectin, what happens is that the, the, uh, the glutamate, um, gated channels are actually left open completely where you know for example what is shown here in orange is ivermectin ivermectin binds to the uh, glutamate uh, um, gated channels leaves this open and then you have a lot of you know, chloride ion actually you know there's no uh, modulation of the you know, the transportation of the chloride uh, the chloride uh, 
of chloride ion in and out of the of the of the nerve, and that leads to hyperpolarization of the nerve. And hyperpolarization of the nerve certainly the parasite will lose uh, the ability to be able to control moses, and that eventually leads to paralysis and and the death of the of the parasite. But the key thing here is the uh, is the fact that you have good selectivity because humans, although there are also some, is certainly secondary side effect that you know you get uh, by uh, you know, uh, that a patient will experience uh, if they're treated with ivermectin. But the primary target, which is the glutamate gated chloride channel, is absent uh, in, right in, in mammalian cells, and that will allow for this type of medicine to be quite effective on the parasite uh, or, uh, relative to. Uh, um, relative to mammalian cells. So, which is, you know, a, a very good concept. And uh, in terms of uh, selectivity, that it is always best if the target in the parasite, for example, in the worms or, or in plasmodium, for example, uh, or in Lishmania to have a target where it is selective for just that target, where the, well, it's just specific for that particular parasite. And then the mammalian cells is able to, is would not be, uh, uh, impacted, you know, in a, in a, uh, strongly by the presence of the drug. But we know in most cases uh, we have some sort of you know, secondary or off-target effect, which are unavoidable. But at least, uh, and the reason why ivermectin is, has been really successful is just because of that very unique selectivity to be able to bind that uh, glutamate-gated uh, chloride channels in the um, in, in worms, and. Um, Apart from this, uh, the, certainly the very, uh, apart from Evermectin, certainly uh, quinine is also a very, very, uh, uh, has been perhaps uh, one of the molecules that have uh, been able to, to bend the hack of history because we know that, uh, you know, uh, 200, 300 years ago, uh, the uh, malaria used to be a, a significant source of uh, mortality, uh, uh, certainly in the tropics, but more so. Uh, during the expansion of the uh, of the British Empire, uh, and um, to be able to control uh, malaria, is that true? You know, uh, during the expansion of the British Empire, or or, or certainly to to be able to explore uh, previously on explore the regions of the world it requires a significant what well, certainly led to significant loss of life, but most not just from in the in the journey itself, but also in the um, uh, you have uh, explorers, you know, being exposed to new climates, new parasites, for example, the malaria parasite, and not having the antidote to actually be able to to to, to be able to to treat uh, uh, to, to treat any sort of uh, diseases. And quinine, uh, you know, was uh, some way there. I guess there are a number of uh, stories or a number of legends about how it was originally discovered, uh, 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 how the it was originally discovered, but the, the, the most certainly what is primary there is that quinine is produced by uh, uh, chinchona, right? And and um, chinchona uh, uh, certainly you know was used uh, by the uh, the um, the inhabitants of Peru, uh, you know, say, uh, four or five hundred years ago to be able to treat and uh, to treat some type of uh, feverish disease. Which is not exactly clear exactly uh, what what caused it, but uh, and uh, somehow the um, constituents of the Peru of that Peruvian plant made it to to Europe, and then suddenly that led to uh, eventually led to isolation of quinine, and uh, uh, from there that allows for uh, uh, significant explore, you know, exploration of uh, of other parts of the tropics. We have uh, exploration of India was made possible by you know. Uh, the gin and tonic, which were made, you know, by mixing uh, quinine with some with some gin uh, and perhaps some sugar to make it more palatable, just because of the suddenly the bitter uh, taste of of quinine, uh, of quinine, and quinine was you know used uh, as a therapy to treat um, uh, to treat uh, uh, malaria, and we still use uh, you know quinine is still you know quite uh, was you know, was used quite a lot. And it's still in clinical use in some parts, uh, especially where you don't have chloroquine resistance, uh, resistant uh, strains of malaria. But we know that we've actually adopted uh, a, a feature of quinine to be able to produce a good number of uh, quinine-derived uh, drugs or natural product-derived antiparasitic agents or anti-malaria agents. Now, the uh, repertoire of um, of 
molecules that have been made using uh, quinine as the subtly as the inspiration. They include these there four uh, amino quinolines, so things like chloroquine or amodaquine, you know, all in the, the basic, perhaps the, the pharmacophore it, it itself comes from these uh, quinoline ring, right? This quinoline ring from, from quinine. Apart from the four amino quinolines, we are, which includes these ones. Also, we have the eight amino quinolines, well, like a primaquine or a tafinoquine, which also, uh, although they mechanistically, we think uh, it, we not ex it's not exactly clear what the eight amino, the targets for the eight amino quinolines are, but you no, know, there are theories about oxidative stress and such. But uh, we perhaps uh, a little bit more uh, definitively, we know that the eight amino uh, the four amino quinolines. Uh, certainly uh, impacts the ability of the parasite to be able to process um, hemoglobin or process him uh, as a case maybe. But the ability to the subtly the 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 fact that um, four aminoquinolines and eight aminoquinolines were developed all goes back to the uh, the initial discovery of quinine in uh, in Chincona as an effective um, an effective anti malaria. Uh, certainly, quinine comes with uh, the bitter taste as well as some uh, uh, significant side effect, which could be mild in, in, in a lot of people. Uh, uh, it could be mild, uh, it could be quite uh, 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 serious uh, uh, in, in patients. And um, uh, apart from that, we know even the, the chloroquine, you know, uh, hydroxychloroquine was in the news last year because of uh, its um, in vitro uh, pass, maybe. Uh, 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 some or just not clear exactly if it's if it's uh, really uh, if it's really effective uh, uh, in vivo effect on on, um, on coronavirus, but we know that historically, you know, chloroquine uh, uh, is a very effective uh, anti-malaria, at least especially on the parasite um, that are non-resistance to it. Now, uh, the Malaria parasite itself is still, you know, you still have a lot of malaria infections, especially in, uh, in Africa and also in, in, in Asia. Uh, but you know, upwards of perhaps 80 percent or so of the of reported uh, infections, as well as disease, uh, as well as death caused by malaria, of course, in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and mostly caused by the Plasmodium uh, uh, falciparum. Now, Plasmodium falciparum is is quite. Um, Perhaps the most is the most dangerous uh, form of um, uh, um, of uh, malaria causing uh, plasmodium, especially because it has a very high. You, typically, you have a very high uh, parasitemia, and more so, there's a lot of drug resistance uh, that has been acquired by the uh, uh, you know, by the parasite, which helps it to evade uh, most of the existing antimalarials. And uh, today, the treatment for Malaria relies on combinations, exactly combinations of uh, different you know, anti-malarias, both the quinine-based or things like chloroquine, or, and also the atomicinin-based. And certainly, the WHO recommendation is really not to use a single monotherapy, but to have at least a, a, a combination of therapies to treat malaria, as long as the combinations do not have uh, any sort of um, uh, antagonistic uh, effect. So today, to treat malaria. It's typically combinations of uh, uh, artemisinin, uh, perhaps with some um, some cases with the um, the uh, the uh, uh, guanine based or perhaps uh, the uh, quinoline based uh, anti malaria, and um, that's uh, in terms of treatment. Also, we also have uh, some type of prophylactic uh, sort of in, uh, preventative uh, um, intervention, which I mostly you know based around this quinine type mole uh, of uh, quinine based mo molecules like chloroquine or primaquine uh, you know, uh, mefloquine uh, and so on so uh there is uh, some investment i think uh, more so in the past maybe 10 years uh, investment in looking for newer antimalarials but uh, it appears that most of what uh, the most effective antimalarials actually have come from from natural products now for chloroquine, which is uh, what is used, what's used as significant and still in clinical use to treat malaria, we know that the mechanism of, of action of chloroquine is actually uh, the prevention of the formation of the non toxic uh, imozoin. And typically, what happens uh, is that when um, for the parasite to survive in red blood cells, it has to scavenge the hemoglobin right into 
the food vacuum and where it serves as a, much like a, a recycle system. So it's trying to get the amino acids from hemoglobin. So you have a series of proteolytic enzymes that helps to break the to break the, the globins in hemoglobin down to the you know peptides and amino acids so that the parasite can use that to build its own uh, pr protein. But also you have the release of heme. Heme by itself could be toxic because of that. Uh, right in the middle here, you have that ion here, which uh, in this case could you know serve as a uh, could catalyze some type of uh, redox reactions. But to be able to, to prevent that. What happens is you have polymerization of that heme into a non-toxic uh, uh, hemozoin. Now, what uh, the chloroquine does is to try to prevent the formation. Well, I guess uh, is, is that it prevents the formation of that of hemozoin, and by so doing, expose the parasites to significant high levels of heme, which could lead to oxidative uh, stress and oxidative damage of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of the the plasmodium uh, cells. Now. Um, through evolutionary pressure, we know that over time, what has happened is that a significant amount of the plasmodium, um, uh, 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 a significant uh, number of uh, mutations have occurred on the transporters you have, we have on the, the digestive food vacuum in plasmodium. And these uh, food vacuum and the, the transporter, which we now refer to as a chloroquine resistant transporter, and the numbers that we see here actually are part of the amino acids where with you know, uh, um, substitutions or mutations have occurred. Perhaps the most important one is the 76. So the mutation here at 76 where lysine residue was, uh, you know, was changed to trionine. And that uh, with, uh, we think prevents, actually allows for the parasite to be able to pump out chloroquine from the food vacuum back into the cytoplasm and therefore not as effective in uh, in uh, uh, killing the, the, the plasmodium, uh, 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 killing the parasite. Now, and if you're thinking, okay, how does that occur? Really, uh, the reason is mostly that the lysine residue is positively charged based on at least what, what we know. Uh, so it's certainly a positively charged. We have the, the terminal amino group and the uh, chloroquine, what happens is when it's in the food vacuum because of the high concentration of protons that we have in the food vacuum becomes protonated and then it's not able to, so you have you have a repulsion, a repulsion as it you know, approaches the, the, the transporter, but because of that mutation of lysine to trionine, that allows for it to be able to be, to, to be pumped out of the food vacuum, therefore preserving that uh, plasmodium. At least that is what uh, the, the evidence that we have for how at least one of the resistance to, um, the, uh, to chloroquine that, that is based on that uh, substitution of a lysine to, to, to trionine. And not just uh, chloroquine, we know atomicinin, there are reports of, uh, of strains, yeah, especially uh, in, um, in Asia, where we are, and also I think there are also reported strains in Africa now where we are, um, you have the parasite uh, also acquiring uh, resistance to atomicinin. And um, that, that is a significant pr problem, maybe a significant problem going forward if we don't have new, uh, new antimalarials that are actually as effective as uh, atomicinin and uh, as chloroquine used to be. So uh, what I want to uh, touch on in the perhaps the next 10 minutes is to actually discuss some of the work that we are doing uh, in this area, both uh, trypanosomes and also malaria to be able to come up with new scaffolds based on natural products that may be developed into, in, into new antiparasitic agents. So an example here is using the, uh, the chloroquine scaffold uh, that we've found in quinine or in the, uh, in the chloroquine or in primaquine to be able to come, to come up with uh, new uh, anti -malaria, uh, potential anti-malaria agents. And an example here is uh, from one of our recent work is using uh, these uh, uh, NOPOR derived molecules here. So this is uh, uh, this substructure here comes from alpha pinene, from, uh, from alpha pinene. And uh, uh, interest here is can we develop uh, molecules 
derived from natural products, but based on existing unknown uh, pharmacophore that we have uh, certainly in the, in the quinine or, or primaquine, for example. So as a part of the, uh, the work itself is uh, making a library of compounds and to be able to derive a library, we need an easily accessible reaction, certainly it's just easily accessible starting material. So an example here is using uh, this uh, NOPOR uh, structure. And uh, what we do is certainly in this case here will be to oxidize it and to, to make a series of amides and uh, esters and also to be able to use the uh, saturation here to be able to derive things like uh, uh, epoxide, which we can open up, or to make azuridines, and perhaps to also just do a direct uh, esterification with uh, 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 some type of uh, carboxylic uh, uh, quinolines. Uh, apart from that, we try to, so like I mentioned, we try to make azuridines, or we try to make diodes with, with the cis and the trans diodes, and uh, using the um, saturation that we have um, in the ring. From that work, well, we have a, a, a series of compounds made, but these are the most significant uh, eat compounds that we've, we've been able to, you know, that we've been able to characterize so far. So we have um, these um, eight, aminoquinoline, uh, eight aminoquinoline based uh, arm, amides derived with nopal with uh, uh, a moderate activity against the uh, plasmodium fasciparum, and this uh, activity is actually matches what, uh, for example, primaquine. Primaquine is not very effective on fasciparum. It's actually more effective on on on, on Vivax and and, Oval, uh, and Ovali, and mostly used as a preventative uh, to be able to clear out both the liver stage and also as a type of uh, uh, prophylactic treatment against malaria. And uh, but from our recent work, we've been able to at least identify these two. Uh, type, uh, these two nopal based um, quinoline amides and uh, our uh, interest would be to uh, try to investigate this further. Uh, these molecules can be, you know, certainly are they effective against the liver stage of uh, P. vivax, for example, or certainly are they, do, do they have any prophylactic uh, effect on them um, uh, on the, um, in, in mice models, for example. And also, you know, very interestingly, we have this uh, ester, which is this, uh, pro, uh, you know, um, this chloro uh, um, quinoline esters. And uh, why this is interesting to us is that when we screen this, so we tested that molecule on the chloroquine sensitive strain, which is the, the D, uh, 3D7 strain, we found you know, that it's got you know, very, it just it's not active against it, but then it's got a quite rather significant uh, activity against the chloroquine resistance strain, which is sort of strange. Although there are reports in the literature that shows that suddenly the acquisition of resistance and some strains of the, of the parasite actually could lead to a loss of fitness, uh, loss of fitness of the parasite itself. So it could be a uh, loss, loss of fitness due to energy metabolism or due to some other, other uh, a secondary effect, but we don't know exactly why this happened, but and we tried a, a number of times to be able to make sure that this data is correct. And we do we, we do know that uh, this compound itself is quite uh, more active on the chloroquine resistance strain relative to chloroquine um, a sensitive, sensitive strain. So it could just mean that perhaps we have a secondary mechanism of action in that strain that this compound is able to is able to do. Now, uh, apart from, from that work, uh, we also have a, a line of work which is based on actually isolating molecules still from natural sources. And an example here is the isolation uh, work that we're doing uh, uh, involving these um, plants referred to as Tabernum Montana longipes. So this is found uh, quite extensively uh, in Central America and uh, just um, perhaps the northern tip of, of South America. And in this case, though, this uh, specific collection came from Costa Rica, from the uh, from um, the cloud forest in um, Monte Verde. And uh, what we try to do here is that from our collections, uh, through collaborations uh, with uh, uh, if, uh, a number of people, we what we do is we, we get the uh, extract, we screen them on the parasite, and we try to track down exactly which of the component is the active ingredient in those extracts. And the, when we did that, uh, we test, we screen the, the library against the parasite, uh, Trapanosoma bruzi, which causes uh, the African sleeping sickness. And like I mentioned earlier, there are two you know, forms of trypan or two clinic, at least the clinically relevant uh, uh, forms of trypanosom uh, trypanosoms. Uh, one is the cruzi, which causes uh, uh, Chagas disease, 
you know, certainly endemic in, um, in, in um, South America, and they are reported a significant number actually in the United States uh, in, in recent years. And, and um, Japanese tuna bruzai, which causes African sickness, more sickness, so, uh, also in, in, in Central Africa, and uh, with a good, most of it, about 80, 90 percent of recent cases in the DR, in DR Congo. When we did that, you know, we have our extraction, we, you know, do that chromatography, screen fractions, screen super fractions, and so on. And what we found out is the, that we're able to isolate these uh, pentacyclic um, tritapenoid tri from that plant, which shows significant uh, 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 antitrepanosoma activity. Uh, one thing about this molecule though is that it is quite hydrophobic, right? It's, it's, as you can see, it's just a bunch of carbons and hydrogens, quite difficult to actually uh, uh, to acid these molecules. We have to add things to solubilize it, but we're able to show at least from our result that it's got significant uh, selectivity for the parasite relative to uh, to uh, corresponding mammalian cells. And then we did um, try to, okay, what can we do to this molecule, which is actually part of the work that we're doing right now, is to kind of make it more soluble. So can we make it more soluble to be able to certainly uh, uh, explore some of the chemistry or some of the um, certainly biological activity a little bit more? And one of the initial things we did is to just hydrolyze of the acetate group and to get the just the free alcohol, and we saw that we have just a marginal uh, improvement in the bioactivity. And uh, what we're doing right now, I'll come back to that, is to try to, can we find a way to functionalize it better, uh, to, to functionalize the molecule, for example, putting a, a, a sugar molecule on it to help to solubilize it. And we, we're doing this, and we think uh, we already have the, this molecule with the sugar. We also try to uh, work using the um, saturation there to make epoxy where we can easily hydrolyze to be able to uh, see if the diols will solubilize it and if that would have effect or uh, any effect on the on the bioactivity or not. Now, um, as part of this work, uh, when we isolated it, uh, we wanted to find out exactly what, what does it do to the parasite? Can we find a mechanism of action or can we at least find an handle to be able to explore some mechanism of action? And we uh, certainly did a metabolic profiling. And, and the way this is done is that we just treat the uh, parasite with uh, different concentrations of the compound, extracted the, the, the metabolites from the parasites, and we just look at, okay, what are the levels of the primary metabolites that are increased or decreased and so on. And just as a summary, what we got from there is that the compound seems to be to affect the uh, cholesterol metabolism, uh, uh, well, at least the serum metabolism, which are based on the structure that is perhaps not, uh, not uh, you know, far-fetched. That might be something that is doing, although we don't know exactly whether which enzyme is inhibiting or, or which uh, pathway is really affecting. But what we will find out is that the parasite seems to have much more lower const, um, um, amount of endogenous uh, steroids, and that allows, uh, and that requires for them to scavenge cholesterol from the cultural medium, which will, you know, certainly uh, indirectly means that the molecule is, uh, has some impact on the, uh, on the steroid metabolism, but we're still not uh, certain exactly where that, um, the activity, um, which uh, specific target uh, that the compounds um, have in the parasite. And, very, and lastly, and uh, perhaps the, uh, the, the, to come to a conclusion here, will be that uh, we are also exploring a series of monotapenoids as uh, both uh, antiparasitic, as uh, antitrapanosoma agents. And um, the, the trick here is to combine a sort of a structure-based design, but using readily available natural product scaffold. So things like, you know, monotapenoids where you find in essential oils, for example, or, or perhaps uh, you know, the things that are easily readily available for things like andamantin or lowball or fencol. And we have a longer series, uh, series of molecules that we're investigating, uh, combining them with some type of uh, uh, you know, with some some type of a scaffold, uh, which you know, I will show you why we're doing that in a minute. But more so, if you consider this, so, so when we did a series of experiments, actually make the compound acid on trypanosomes, then uh, we use uh, you know certainly some um, uh, 
calculations to be able to predict some analogs of this. So in this case, would be to use a bioisotheric replacements where we're actually looking at what can we replace these natural products with and we still have, you know, maintain the physical chemical properties of the molecule, but perhaps have an increased uh, bio, um, bioactivity. And that led us to be able to identify these two molecules here, one with uh, no pore structure, and also, also this one here with um, this 8 aminoquinoline amino structure, which just shows very significant effect. Although when we assay these in, in vivo, in mice model, we didn't have any, the result when we're not, uh, we're not promising. Uh, and then eventually what we did here was just to do a type of a scaffold opening. And, and the reason is, okay, can we drive up the activity on the parasite? And can we find a target in the parasite that these molecules could be targeting? And to do that, we did screen them on uh, this cysteine protease because of the, you know, the vinyl sulfonyl group that we have in the parasite. And we show that these uh, form as actually a significant inhibition of the cysteine protease. And uh, it's still, uh, although the activity on the parasite itself is much more uh, uh, reduced. And today, what we're doing with this type of molecules is still to explore analogs uh, of the aminoquinoline uh, substructure to be able certainly to improve the activity on the parasite and uh, more so to extend the selectivity that the price of the drug against the parasite uh, relative to, to corresponding mammalian, uh, mammalian cells. So uh, th this, I guess that uh, in the past uh, few minutes, I've just kind of touched on, you know, just a, a summary of some of the work that we're doing to um, explore a natural products um, uh, scaffold. And just in summary, so uh, this morning, uh, certainly what I've uh, been able to uh, uh, communicate, I hope, I hope I've been able to communicate to you is the role that natural products plays in uh, both the discovery of new and, and uh, of uh, parasitic, anti-parasitic agents. And a very, very, uh, uh, you know, important anti-parasitic agent is ivermectin, which is produced by a bacteria and we've used, we used it now to treat a significant number of uh, diseases ca caused by worms. Also, uh, quinine came from a chinchona plant, which has certainly, uh, you know, been uh, in the words of, uh, I think, uh, uh, Winston Churchill says that, uh, you know, uh, gin and tonic uh, perhaps uh, has preserved more British life than any other doctors uh, in Europe have done uh, throughout the Second World War. And, uh, and that chemistry that is, that is uh, uh, present in that molecule is still quite uh, very relevant to some of the newer structures that we are exploring and also a lot of people are exploring uh, 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 around the world. And uh, uh, certainly uh, in some of our work, we're still doing isolation as well as uh, uh, structure-based work to be able to explore or uh, at least utilize the chemistry provided by um, provided by uh, natural products. And lastly, I just want to thank uh, my co-workers. A uh, lot of this work I've done uh, perhaps uh, uh, with the effort of a number of people, my uh, students, uh, collaborators, uh, 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 William Setzer at, uh, Onsville, uh, at Alabama in Onsville, uh, at uh, NYU, and uh, a couple of uh, folks um, in Brazil and also in Switzerland uh, helping to assay and also to be able to explore some of the biology of the compounds we're making, and certainly the NIH for providing uh, a good amount of funding uh, over the past few years for us to do uh, some of this, to play with some of these things and uh, for us to at least uh, uh, explore newer chemotypes against uh, some of this parasite. Thank you very much and I appreciate uh, your time and I'm uh, happy uh, to answer any of your questions. Thanks, Angie. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Wow, I learned a lot from that presentation. Thank you very much. And just to see the progression from taking natural substances and how much work goes into isolating and improving and reducing toxicity, uh, to help human health in the global south. Thank you for, for giving us such an in-depth and informative presentation. Um, there are a couple questions and I'm just gonna say, uh, because the presentation was fascinating, we didn't interrupt you for any questions. People can certainly follow up with you um, and there will be a follow-up podcast. And so you'll have opportunities if you wanna talk with uh, Dr. Victor more in depth. But one of the questions that you have is, is the mechanism of action for these anti-malarial drugs, such as ivermectin, the same MOA that is sought after for treating autoimmune diseases with anti-malarial drugs? 
So, uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to say the best way. So, the mechanism certainly is, uh, it is different uh, as far as, uh, as as far as I know. Uh, more so for ivermectin, perhaps there is uh, the most, well, you know, perhaps the most uh, accepted th uh, mechanism of action for against the worms is certainly through the, the effect of ivermectin on the glutamate um, gated uh, uh, chloride uh, 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 channels. But when it comes to malaria and also any of the autoimmune diseases, it's still not clear exactly as far as I, uh, as I know that, uh, that we know precisely what, what the avamectin does. Um, for chloroquine, chloroquine has a different mechanism on the malaria parasite relative to avamectin. So chloroquine is through the inhibition of uh, formation of imozoin, while that of avamectin is, is certainly completely different. So I think they have different mechanisms of actions. Although some of the reported, uh, uh, in some cases, the mechanism could be, you know, it, it's, it's some could be speculative in, some, in, in most instances. But uh, so uh, they are quite different. I think that would be the correct answer to, to that question. Great. Um, and there's a question about oregano oil. So we have uh, a, a farmer or a person who's keeping chickens. Shelly has chickens and she uses oregano essential oil to keep bacteria and virus away, is that something that humans also can use to combat many of these things? So um, that is possible, but you know, sometimes the, the question is the toxicity when it comes to um, injection of, um, of, of, of oil or of some medicine. So, you know, if uh, the way the essential oil is used to keep it away, I don't, I'm not sure exactly the keeping, is it the keeping away of uh, as the, um, you know, external application of it or actually ingestion, but it is possible that it could be used, but, and um, uh, essential oil is, could be useful for topical, uh, for the topical application. Um, and I know a series of groups that are actually working on, uh, for example, to treat Lishmania, where it's just applying uh, some type of, uh, ethanolic extract on the skin of, uh, of individuals, but sometimes you also need some type of systemic treatment where you actually have to uh, ingest some type of uh, drug to, if, if, for example, parasites that are not just on the skin, but also they live uh, in the, you, know, you have them in some tissues. So for those type of medicines to get there, then you have to have a, a systemic uh, medicine. Uh, I'm one thing about uh, essential oils could also be the, the uh, you know, some of the components and perhaps not of quite soluble in aqueous in, in aqueous uh, uh, solution, and that could have you know you can have uh, administration uh, issues where they are not able to get to the site of action. They are not able mm. to go intracellularly to, for example, for intracellular parasite. But if uh, some of the you know things like uh, you know skin disease or parasite that is you know uh, there are ectopic disease or things like lice or fleas and stuff, then it's possible that certainly uh, 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 the essential oils would be a, 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 a sort of, certainly is used in some cases. And it's also, you know, in the future, uh, if we have uh, some control trials to be able to prove the efficacy of them, we can certainly use it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. And thank you doctor for giving us this presentation <laughs> and we will conclude today's session the, the the replay will be posted this afternoon so please stay tuned and share the presentation thank you thank you thank you everybody